and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. So Kelsey, today we are minus one day, but almost exactly one month away from your wedding. Oh my god, don't remind me. <laughs> so how are you doing with all that? Um, it's surprising because I am slightly stressed because there's things I need to do for this wedding that I still need to do and I'm thinking about, but the reality is I feel like work is way more stressful for me right now because <laughs> I'm leaving for such a long period of time that I need to get so much organized for work and every time I turn around, it's just crazy. I've spent so much time at my computer and since the main function of my job is not actually at my computer... The fact that I spend most of my day at the computer just tells you how much shit I need to get done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get it done. And the truth is, I think we're very much alike in the fact that like when we are away from something, we want to make sure all the ducks are in a row and all contingencies are planned for. But usually everyone around us makes it work. So <laughs> yeah, I know. And I just I know that people are competent and they make it work. I just... They're not me, and I know that their level <laughs> their level of commitment to making it work is just not as high, and oh. so I'm trying to give them, like, a plan A, B, and C. Really, oh, I yeah. just need to give them plan A, and they can figure out B and C, but... Yeah, well, that doesn't sound familiar at all. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's me, too. Hopefully I none you. of my coworkers listen to this podcast and hear me say that nah. they're not, their commitment to making it work isn't as high. <laughs> well, uh, you'll hear about it if they do, I'm sure. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. So before we jump into the book that we've read this week, though, I have a question. Kelsey, speaking of our relationships here, how does your competitive nature affect your relationship? Ah, that's a great question. So I find myself to be a chill person, but I definitely have a competitive edge and I get competitive about weird things. And unfortunately, my future spouse is the same way. <laughs> In where we get into a competitive nature about weird things like there will be some fact on TV and I will give a little input and he will test me on that input to the point where we're both Googling things to prove the other one right or wrong. <laughs> well, thank God for the Googs. <laughs> oh, God, there's a lot of Googling that goes on and there's a lot of really just stupid things that come in. I really like board games, but I think it's a good thing John isn't as into board games because I feel like that could actually be really bad if we were both like super board game all the time. Because it would definitely be very heated. <laughs> yeah. So for me, my husband, his name is Dave. And Dave is not as competitive as me outwardly. He's actually very competitive. And so if the two of us have to do a task, we are a great team because we are in it to win it. Like there is no, there is no second place. You know, we joke second place is first loser. Yeah. Like we're very <laughs> like, as a team, we're great. But when it comes to other things... Generally speaking, like the little nitpicky things, I'll try to like rile up something or I'll get all riled and he's just like, it's not like whatever. He's just so chill. He's like oil and water, like everything rolls off of it. Uh -oh. So like he's probably a good balance for me. But then sometimes I'm like, no, this is important. He's like, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, no, it's important. <laughs> I'll always be like, listen, like this is what, you know, this means or this is this fact. Like you have to agree with me here. And he's like, uh-huh, sure, whatever. And I'm just like, Ugh. Uh, so anyhow, I mean, it's probably a good thing. But. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the in it to win it as a team is definitely something that is a very true fact. Um, we're a great team when we are on the team together. However, when we are against <laughs> each other, it's not so great. Yeah, we actually really wanted to be on The Amazing Race once. And we talk all the time about how we would totally kill on The Amazing Race. The only problem with the two of us is that I hate swimming with sea creatures and he also like is a little bit like Fezzik where like I only dog battle <laughs> <laughs> so all the water based competition stuff might be a bit difficult for us but again we're so competitive <laughs> we would make it work there you go <laughs> well I hope to see you on a season of the amazing race should it continue yeah uh maybe it'll happen you never know <laughs> you never know 
So we're talking about competitive natures because in our book this week, there is some heated competition and we find out the Bridgerton family has a competitive side. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yes. So today we are talking about The Viscount Who Loved Me by Julia Quinn. And our main characters today are Anthony Bridgerton, who is The Viscount, and Kate Sheffield. So today we have a couple of history facts that really relate to this book. So we're going to skip right past our author facts to get straight to those. Yes. So today we're going to talk about the history of Pall Mall, which is basically an early version of croquet. And this comes to play because the Bridgertons are very interested in Pall Mall. How do I say it? Pall Mall. Sure. There's a French tra- version, I remember that they say it, that looks like more of the way you said it the first time, but I couldn't even try to replicate that. So we're going to say Paul Mall. All right, Paul Mall. <laughs> like, like the Californians we are. Heck yes. <laughs> so tell me more about Paul Mall. So Paul Mall derives from Latin, meaning mallet and ball, and it was first brought to England between 1630 and 1685 with King Charles II of England. It was very popular during his reign, but it was a bit simpler than what the Bridgertons play, which is a little bit closer to modern croquet in the sense that there are wickets and balls that go through the hoops and hit at the end. The first version basically was like a stick at each side, but you didn't have to go through obstacles. Cool. And fun things, as they say, some early versions of Pall Mall were played over the distance of like a golf course. So imagine how large a golf course is. Like that's what they were playing Pall Mall over. Whoa. So while it was a little simpler than croquet, you could play it over a longer distance. And then they even had indoor versions of it, which were kind of like a billiards thing where it was just a small indoor version of it. And then you had the modern iteration of croquet where it's kind of played as a like a lawn game in the backyard or front yard, as it were. I have to say, after reading this book, I really wanted to get myself a croquet set. And I realized that my backyard is a little bit too small to fully enjoy a good game of croquet. So I I refrained for now. I have no backyard for croquet. I do not have that type of yard. (laughs) My yard is just one big hill. (laughs) And it kind of lost popularity in the the 1700s, but then it kind of reemerged towards more towards the late 1800s as modern croquet, which did become very popular and was popular into like the 1920s. So fun. Yeah. I once went to a bachelorette party that was Downton Abbey themed. And so there was a croquet set and we took the most ridiculous photo of all of us like posed with like very like prim faces (laughs) with croquet. So I'll have to dig that up and put that on our Instagram. (laughs) It's pretty epic. Excellent. All right. So what's our next history fact, Zoe? So our next fact comes about because of a sad dimension of our story. And we did mention this in the first book, and it revolves around how the late Viscount Bridgerton died, which is Anthony's father. So Anthony's father died from a bee sting. And as we learn in this book, he didn't die the first time he was stung by a bee, but he died the second time he was stung by a bee. And back in the early 1800s, there was really no explanation for this. And Anthony really wrestles with it in the story. And it's a big part of his character, just his whole relationship with his father and and how he deals with his father's death. Death. So I wanted to talk a little bit about anaphylaxis and uh, kind of in conjunction epinephrine, just the history of that because it wasn't around at this time. So anaphylaxis is Greek for without protection, and it is a severe allergic reaction that occurs when the body launches a full scale attack on a seemingly innocuous substance like a bee, right? Lots of people get stung by bees. It hurts, but it's not the kind of thing that kills us. So in the most serious versions of anaphylaxis, the body's blood pressure plummets and all of the airways close off, meaning that the person can go from eating dinner to fighting for their life within moments. And that's what happens to Anthony's father. So this kind of came about as a discovery from French physiologist Charles Roche, and he was actually awarded the Nobel Prize in 1913. So this is 100 years after we're talking this this Bridgerton story. He is responsible for describing and naming the phenomenon of anaphylaxis. And the way that he found it is that he was studying 
basically poison and the effects of poison and if people could potentially get immune to poisons. So they were using a sea anemone toxin and they were using dogs at this time to do their studies. And all of a sudden one day, it was the second injection of these dogs and eight of the dogs died sadly that day immediately uh, after being injected. So that was how kind of this first known thing happened by a very, very minimal amount. Anyhow, so in general, the research for anaphylaxis really helped elucidate hay fever, asthma, other allergic reactions to foreign substances, and explained some previously not understood cases of intoxication and sudden death, like Anthony's father. So obviously, very important discovery, very interesting, and I also recommend that you listen to the Sawbones episode on the EpiPen. This is another podcast called Sawbones, and their EpiPen is from August 2016, and they have the whole story of the science cruises with Prince Albert, where they go chasing after a Portuguese man of war to get the toxin, and then they end up with sea anemones instead. Anyhow, they have a really comprehensive version of all those events, and it is quite interesting, so I recommend in that. But what I do also want to mention is that Roche was not only a Nobel Prize winner for his work on anaphylaxis, but he was also a eugenicist. Excellent. And a paranormal <laughs> researcher. So we can also thank him for coining the term ectoplasm in 1894. And he also advocated the sterilization and marriage prohibition for those with mental disabilities. What a winner. I know. He expressed his racist and eugenist ideas in his 1919 book, La Selection Humaine. And he was a firm believer in the inferiority of blacks, comparing black people to apes and intellectually to imbeciles. I feel it is important to say all of that because although we can thank him for his great work in and his discovery for anaphylaxis, he is a pretty awful human being. Yes, he's one of those did great things for mankind, but was actually a huge prick. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to put it for sure. But I think it's interesting to also note that epinephrine wasn't available as a drug until shortly after 1900, and the EpiPen wasn't invented until 1987. So we're talking basically, I mean, close to 200 years after, 200 years after the setting of this book before really anything that could have saved the Viscount. So I just think that's pretty interesting. And, you know, epinephrine is considered a vital drug, yet it's still a costly burden to many patients who need it today. So a hot topic for sure. Yes, for sure. All right. Well, we have lots to talk about. So let's move on. So we are going to be talking in this book about a couple of choice themes that we are coming across very regularly. In this book, we're going to find our enemies become lovers. Yeah, that's definitely, I would say, the main the main trope of this book. But there's a couple others. So we've got our main characters are caught in a compromising situation. Brett row. And both of them have some secret pain and some scars from their secret pains. Exactly. So that makes for some interesting book. Luckily, this is not as trope heavy as some of the other ones. This is true. It is pretty straightforward. So let's get right into it. So as a reminder... Our main characters are Viscount Anthony Bridgerton and Kate Sheffield. So first, we shall start with our prologue. Anthony Bridgerton had a very close relationship with his father. His father was really kind of the best of men. They describe him as a guy who didn't shun his children. He took great pains to take Anthony, who is his firstborn, out on walks in the countryside and was really close with him. And then when Anthony had younger brothers... He brought the brothers along, and then when they had a sister, he didn't shy away from including the sister in their adventures. He was very close with his children, and Anthony really idolized him and considered him the best version of a man and all he could hope to aspire to. And Anthony never begrudged his dad giving attention to his siblings because he always felt that as the oldest, he'd known his father for the longest. And so that made them have a special bond that could never be towed upon by any of the siblings. 
And unfortunately, as Anthony arrived home at the age of 18 before university, he finds Daphne in the hall and she's crying and he sees that she just looks heartbroken and she tells him that father is dead and he was stung by a bee and Anthony at first scoffs at the idea and says he couldn't die by a bee. He's a healthy, strong man. How could he be felled by an innocent little bee? So he rushes upstairs where he sees his mother is just completely distraught and is crying and is almost lifeless. And he takes in the tragedy and takes the burden of the family. And he sits with his father that night through the night once his mother goes to bed and he thinks over his relationship with his father and trying to digest the tragedy that has befallen them all and really concludes that he could never surpass his father in anything, including age. He's assuming that he's going to die just as young. He's going to live until his father lived, which is until the age of 38. And he can't live a minute more because his father didn't get a minute more. And as his father was the best of men, Anthony can't imagine being more in any way. So this is where he determines that he's going to live his life to the fullest, but also try to live it in a way where he cannot leave a tragedy behind him when he dies at a young age. So now we get into our main story after that heartbreaking and heart-wrenching prologue, which I will discuss more in our discussion. <laughs> Yes. So now we meet Kate Sheffield, who is having her first season in London at the age of 20, which is old, yes, but it's because the family has had to bring her sister and her out at the same time. And Edwina is 17, just about to turn 18. And Kate is also just about to turn 21. <laughs> but that's besides the point. So her family, they kind of live in genteel poverty. Kate's father passed away a few years ago. They have enough money to get by, but not enough that they can just fling it all around. So they make the effort to have one season. Kate's a little older. Edwin is a little younger, but they're making it work. Hopefully one or both girls makes a decent match. If they don't make a match, though, it's not the end of the world because they do have enough money that they can support themselves, you know, modestly as a family if neither girl marries. And they're kind of pinning their hopes on Edwina, though. She was instantly declared the incomparable for the season. And Kate's fine with that. She really doesn't feel any envy towards her sister. She knows she's playing her. Edwina's petite and blonde in a perfect English rose. And Kate knows that Edwina is just as gorgeous on the inside as she is on the outside. So Kate is just fine with being the incomparable's older sister with her brown hair, brown eyes, and a little too tall for most men. <laughs> I also like you had a note here about Edwina. You wrote, after she's gorgeous and kind on the outside, yada, yada. You wrote, she's also a secret bookworm, which I love. And now I want to read books about secret bookworms all the time. I know. That, <laughs> that <laughs> is a trope that I could get behind. Oh, yes. So Kate, she's a little tall. She's also a little clumsy. She doesn't find the pretty things like simpering, mincing, and dancing to come naturally to her. She feels a little awkward in her skin, but she's learned to live with it. And she's okay with it, actually. She's very fine with Edwina getting the attention. And she's just going to make sure Edwina makes the best match possible. This would not include Anthony Bridgerton. Absolutely not. No. According to Lady Whistledown, Anthony Bridgerton is an absolute rake, and Kate is very fond of Lady Whistledown because she's mostly right after all. She's usually right in all things. Yes. <laughs> so if she says Anthony Bridgerton is the worst of the rakes, then he must be a truly horrid person, and Edwina should avoid him at all costs. And of course, like the last Bridgerton book, we get a delicious bit of Lady Whistledown at the beginning of every chapter. Yes. We also find out that Kate is the proud owner of an overweight corgi named Newton, to which my notes said, Korg! <laughs> Luckily, Kate's not that worried about Anthony because, for all intents and purposes, the ton knows that he's not planning to marry. However. However, <laughs> Anthony has decided to get married. Yep, he's finally realized, you know, he's 29, he's almost 30, he only has eight years left to live, so he better yeah. settle down and make himself an heir. Yes. And of course, being a man, 
he decides upon the season's incomparable as his wife. He does come to it in a discussion with his brothers after he shocks them by announcing his intentions, whereas Benedict falls over in a chair and Colin spits out whatever it is he's drinking when he announces it. Mm -hmm. But then he asks who the season's incomparable was. They say Edwina Sheffield is considered the incomparable this year. And it is really important that he not marry someone who's stupid. He would like his children to be at least somewhat intelligent. So he asks if she seems intelligent. They say, yes, to all intents and purposes, she's not an idiot. So, of course, perfect. She's pretty and not stupid. I'll take it. Yeah, it's nice to be so decisive, I suppose. Yeah. And... I do want to point out that coming into this book, you know, we just read the last one where we pretty much called Anthony, Anthony the ass. So, so far, he hasn't actually done any assery uh, yet in this book. No. Um, and he's a little bit different in this book than, than other books. We get some glimpses, but so far, he's a fine, he's a fine man. Yes. There's nothing against her for him yet. He's pretty neutral. He's making decisions, but we know his basis for decisions. He's very thoughtful about said decisions. Yep. And he is warned by Colin, however, that Edwina has claimed she will never marry without her sister's approval. So that has been remarked upon by the ton as a very odd thing. Nobody has done or said such a thing before. But Edwina and her sister are really close. They have a great relationship. Yes. Kate's relationship with Edwina, even though she's her half-sister, and their her stepmother, Mary, who is Edwina's mom, is very close. She loves her family to pieces and is a champion for Edwina in a lot of ways. Partly why Anthony has chosen Edwina in this most cavalier manner is because he is determined to never fall in love with his bride. That is his end goal. He's going to get married and produce an heir. And while he knows love exists and he treats it very sacredly, he does not want it for himself because he does not want to replicate the tragedy that his mother suffered when her husband died young. Yeah, he basically thinks that he can shoulder the burden of knowing that he will die young, but if he had love, it would be too hard for him. So he is avoiding love at all costs. And I meant to write that as one of our tropes because we see that a lot in books where we have a hero that's like, I refuse to fall in love. Yeah. So this is the... That should be a trope for sure. <laughs> unwilling to fall in love hero. So then after we've figured out what all of our characters' purposes and intents are, we arrive at this evening's ball. Yes. At the ball that evening, Kate, Sheffield, and Edwina are there as well as the Bridgertons. And Colin meets Kate. <laughs> and uh, once again, I love Colin. Yeah, he's pretty great. <laughs> he's pretty great. And once Mary introduces Kate to Colin, Mary runs off to speak to Mrs. Featherington. Who wants to speak to Mrs. Featherington? I don't actually know. But apparently Mary really needs to speak to her. Yeah, I think it's more of a ploy to get Kate and Colin talking. <laughs> oh, for sure. They have a really great conversation, which once again proves Colin to be everyone's favorite brother. Oh, yes. To just convey what they spoke about and how it went, I'm going to convey a couple of these quotes. <clears throat> So Kate is kind of skeptical of Colin because of his brother's reputation. So she says, it had occurred to me that you might be rather like your brother. That is all. My brother, the Viscount, she said, thinking it must be obvious. I have three brothers, he explained. Oh, she felt stupid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too, he said with great feeling. Most of the time, they're a dreadful nuisance. <laughs> oh, um, so cute. Yes. Kate discovers in this conversation that the Bridgertons are devoted to the family unit, which is actually a good thing for Kate, because she's the same way. They converse a bit more, and Colin decides that Kate must meet Anthony. She's already claimed that she wants nothing to do with him, and Colin also knows that Anthony is going to pursue her sister. Kate doesn't know that yet, but Colin does. I also think that the moment that Colin meets Kate, he realizes that Kate is going to vex oh, Anthony 100%. a million percent and also like yeah <laughs> I think it's true and he even says yes he said still sounding most heartily amused you must meet my brother the Viscount she asked with disbelief well you might enjoy Gregory's company as well he allowed but as I said he is only 13 and likely to put a frog on your chair and the Viscount is not likely to put a frog on your chair, he said with an utterly serious face. 
<laughs> it's so good. Yeah, I loved that quote too. I definitely highlighted it. And it's it's just so Colin. I love how good Julia Quinn is with comedy. So Colin is obviously the comedic relief in most of these books, but in a way that is comes just to like sophisticated little... and it comes off it. very <laughs> effortlessly. Yes. It's just a joy to read. Agreed. So then Colin decides to play matchmaker here and tells Anthony that he must meet Edwina's sister because she's been saying so much about him and he implies that it's all good things. So then Anthony's like, okay, I'll go meet her. And this is where Anthony makes his first big mistake. Yes. <laughs> So initially, when Anthony meets her, he thinks Colin has set her up to be this poor, plain spinster. But Anthony sees Kate and he's like, oh, well, she's pretty, not plain. And so he says, he blunders by saying, you're just as lovely as your sister. Where Kate's like, no, I'm not. Are you just trying to schmooze me? (laughs) Yeah, she is super put off by this. And the quote is... If she had seemed uncomfortable before, her bearing now turned downright hostile, and Anthony realized with a mental slap that he'd said exactly the wrong thing. Of course he should not have compared her to her sister. It was the one compliment she could never have believed. And you, Lord Bridgerton, she replied in a tone that could have frozen champagne, are almost as handsome as your brother. Oh! (laughs) I... Love her. (laughs) Yes. And also Anthony realizes that his brother has set him up. Very soundly set him up, including forcing them to dance together like the trickster that he is. Yes. And they have such a great spar while they dance. She is trying to be nice, but he kind of gets under her skin. So she becomes her blunt self. And Anthony, instead of being offended, just rises to the challenge. And that's really what it is, is he sees her and their conversation as a challenge that he must win. Yeah. So even though Kate says, you will never marry my sister, Anthony says, oh, he will. If he asks Edwina, she will say yes. So the challenge has been made. Yes, it has. And the next day, Anthony comes out guns blazing And pulls a move that he knows will work. Oh, yes. So he pays a call on the Sheffield house and stealing a trick from Simon in book one, which he also openly admits that he did. Yep. Shows up with not one, but three bouquets of flowers. One for each Sheffield. (laughs) Yep. So Kate is a bit miffed because these are like exactly the flowers she'd want someone to bring her and no one's ever brought her flowers before even though she gets all of Edwina's flowers because they make Edwina sneeze it was a very kind gesture and Kate is not a vindictive person so she she does let Anthony know that she appreciates the flowers but then she tells him Edwina's not there she is out on a drive with none other than Nigel Beerbrook So her stepmother, Mary, eventually shows up into the scene and suggests that Kate take her dog Newton on a walk and maneuvers Anthony onto that walk with Kate as well. And there's a very funny scene when Anthony meets Newton Mm -hmm. because Newton loves Mary, but Mary does not return the affection. So Newton just tries very hard to gain Mary's affection. So when he hears the barking and hears about the dog, he assumes he's going to find this big mastiff because Kate, with her prickly attitude, must have a mastiff at home. Mm -hmm. But no, she has a fat little cord. (laughs) Yeah, so cute. So Kate and Anthony head out of the house with Newton. So on the walk, they start to converse. And while they are trading barbs here and there, Anthony finds that He actually is enjoying his conversation with Kate, and he's finding her rather to be pleasant to be around. And as they're walking, you know, they bump into each other, and he notices her intoxicating scent, an odd combination of exotic lilies and sensible soap. And actually, I'll be honest, this is one of the better descriptions because I was like, ooh, that's nice. (laughs) Yeah, lilies and soap. So great. I'm into it. And she also smells the clean, soapy scent of him because, you know... 
scent is so important, guys. It really is. Got to know what they smell like. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we're walking and there's a, like I said, bit of barbs back and forth. Overall, actually pleasant. They're enjoying each other's company. And then Newton spies something and pulls his leash out of Kate's hand and goes careening off across the park. And Kate, being Kate, goes chasing after him. Oh, yes. So Anthony, as a gentleman, must follow. <laughs> Yeah, and what finally happens to slow Newton's uh, forward projection is that he actually spies Edwina because Nigel Beerbrook's carriage has broken in some respect and they've, they're have they standing by the river and so Newton goes careening towards Edwina and just barrels into her and knocks her into the water. Yes, and this is where we start to see Anthony's temper that we know from the last book take effect. He mm -hmm. is furious because he just saw it happening. It was like slow-mo as Newton like collided with Edwina and knocked her into the lake. So he fishes Edwina out and is mad at Nigel because Nigel just stood there. And he is so furious that he takes a carriage from a friend, takes Edwina home, leaves Kate there with Newton to basically think about her actions. And she has to hang out with uh, Burbrook, who is, as we know, not the best conversationalist. No. No. So Edwina gets a cold from her dunk in the lake, and so she's not seen in society for a while. Kate and Mary have been avoiding social events, but on the night of the Bridgerton musical, even though Edwina needs one more day of rest, Mary declares that Kate must accompany her to the musical. Kate's not really in the mood to see Anthony Bridgerton, so she's kind of hoping to hide. And Anthony Bridgerton is kind of not in the mood to see Kate, mainly because he can't stop thinking about her, and he's having yeah. erotic dreams about her. You know. So they kind of want to avoid each other, but Kate also notices, because she's very skeptical of his rake persona, she sees the soprano making eyes at Anthony Bridgerton and him not really doing anything to shun it. He's kind of like asking for it. Yeah, and he is definitely reciprocating those advances. Oh, yes. And when the soprano is done singing... Kate goes in after meeting Lady Bridgerton, who she likes very much. She goes into the hall and kind of just is hoping for some peace and quiet away from everybody else when suddenly she hears voices, one of which she recognizes as Anthony's. So she quickly goes through the nearest closed door in order to avoid him, but she ended up putting herself in his study, which just happens to have been his destination with the lovely soprano. So the only place for her to hide is under his desk. So quickly she ducks down and hopes that he doesn't find her, but she is not so lucky. No. During his discussion with the soprano where he's kind of making advances, you know, trying to install her as a mistress and they're talking about it. He goes over to pour a brandy and Kate sees him thinking, don't turn around, don't turn around. But he does. Mm -hmm. So he apologizes to the soprano, maneuvers her out the door and locks himself and Kate in where he rails at her for how dare she invade his study. And she's like, I didn't mean to be here. But he doesn't really think that. He thinks she's just meddling, so he tries to get in her face. But unfortunately, the pull took over, and he couldn't resist, so he kissed her instead. Yes, and she is obviously flabbergasted, but she also kisses him back. <laughs> yes, and he's a little stunned, too, but he kind of just goes with it because he's really enjoying it. Eventually, they break away from each other and they trade barbs. And this is where we see the ass of old come out. I think it's really funny because you wrote that in our notes. And I had literally at the same point selected a passage and wrote Anthony the ass. Yes. So, yeah. So, so we do get a little bit of who we know Anthony to be, which actually I think is good because otherwise it would be like, well, who am I reading about? <laughs> yes, but now that he's our main character, we see his internal dialogue where he kind of knows he's being an ass and he mm -hmm. feels bad about it, but he can't yep. back down from it. Basically, he had locked the door and when Kate goes to leave, she finds the door is locked and instead of just giving her the key, he kind of throws it to her knowing she'll miss it. He throws it in a way where it does land at the, on the floor, so she's forced to pick it up like she's picking up her dignity. And he even says he 
felt the ridiculous impulse to leap forward and grab the key from the carpet to get down on one knee and hand it to her to apologize for his conduct and beg her for forgiveness. But he doesn't. (laughs) <laughs> um, because he doesn't need his her favorable opinion in his mind. And so they part on that note. So now Lady Bridgerton, as we know, is a matchmaking mama and she's pretty observant. And she's kind of realized that Anthony is into at least one of the Sheffield sisters and she can't figure out who. So she invites them to her country estate for a house party. Yes. And all kind of scandalous things happen at house parties. Yes. This is where things get interesting. Yes. So he's planning to avoid Kate at all costs, but that obviously doesn't happen. No. Kate, talking to Lady Bridgerton, decides to go for a walk in the gardens, and then Anthony, when he tells his mother that he is going to go for a walk, she she nicely suggests he go out to the garden, where they, of course, run into each other. And Anthony actually decides to apologize to Kate because he's been thinking about their last interaction in his study and he realizes that he was an ass. And so it's a bit awkward, but he does apologize. And Kate assumes that it's also that he's apologizing for kissing her, even though to him he wanted to just apologize for his behavior after the kiss. But he tacks that on and and, and apologizes for both. But then he's so tempted to kiss her again in that moment. But luckily, they are interrupted by Colin. Yay, Colin. And he says to Anthony that Daphne has just arrived with Simon and she has suggested they play Paul Mall. Which is fantastic because we find the Bridgertons do not play fair. <laughs> nope. The goal is not to win. The goal is to make keep everybody else from winning. Exactly. And so Anthony says he'll go get Edwina to make the numbers even. So he's off. Kate's not happy about it, but she does have a great interaction with Colin. And then she meets Daphne, whom she really enjoys right away. And then they have some fun interactions setting up the game, as well as choosing which color mallet everyone shall get. And Kate chooses the black mallet. Which is dubbed... The Mallet of Death. Yes. And Anthony is the one who gave it that name. And Colin, when he sees her pick that mallet, he goes, approvingly, I knew she'd make a fine player. Yes. (laughs) And so then, since Anthony and Edwina are not back yet, and no one really knows why, the siblings being siblings conspire to give him the pink mallet, because while the purple ones left he'll hate the pink more. So they literally (laughs) chuck the purple one into the shed, leaving only the pink and the blue left, which of course they give Edwina the blue one. So Anthony is forced to have pink. To match her eyes. It was already decided. Yes. (laughs) And I'm not really going to do justice to the game. So I'm just going to read a couple quotes from the game to convey the fun that it is in seeing the Bridgerton siblings in their element and how Kate actually would make a great Bridgerton. Uh Why, Edwina whispered in Kate's ear, do I get the feeling I am intruding upon a family spat? I think the Bridgertons take Pall Mall very seriously, Kate whispered back. The three Bridgerton siblings had assumed bulldog faces, and they all appeared rather single-mindedly determined to win. (laughs) Colin, Daphne cut in, don't curse. There are ladies present. You don't count. There are two ladies present who are not me. (laughs) She ground out. Daphne turned to Kate and Edwina and explained, bad sportsmanship is a requirement in Bridgerton Pall Mall, I'm afraid. And finally, after Kate sinks Anthony's ball into the lake, you don't win, Anthony snapped. Oh, it feels like I've won, she reveled. Colin and Daphne, who had come dashing down the hill, skidded to a halt before them. Well done, Miss Sheffield, Colin exclaimed. I knew you were worthy of the mallet of death. Brilliant, Daphne agreed. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so the game ends with Kate, who was already in last because Anthony had sabotaged her early in the game, but she ends up knocking Anthony's ball into the lake after Colin alley-oops it to her, and it prevents Anthony from winning, and everybody else declares Kate the winner for making Anthony not win, and so that was the conclusion of the match. The Bridgertons truly appreciate a devious mind. Yes. So after the game, Kate and Anthony 
are fishing the pink ball out of the lake and kind of get left behind. And they're becoming a bit more friends than rivals. And, you know, a good competition can sometimes bring people together. Absolutely. And that night, Kate also sees a different side of Anthony. She watches him give a very direct cut to a particularly nasty debutante and escort Penelope Featherington who we're starting to get to know and who's becoming a bit more of a character in her own right as these books continue. And who turns out she's aware her mother dresses her in terrible clothes. Yeah, she's super aware. Anyhow, she and Kate really get on and Kate can't help but appreciate Anthony's move as he gives this awful girl the cut direct, grabs Penelope, takes her into dinner, you know, eschewing social protocols. And he also whispers in Penelope's ear, but Kate can hear it like, He says, I do hate a bully, don't you? Yes. And she suddenly wasn't so certain that he was the soulless, reprehensible rake she'd taken such a comfort in believing him. Yikes. So she's kind of not able to fully hate him anymore. No. And after everyone retires for the night, Kate can't quite sleep because partly because there's a storm approaching and she's really terrified of electrical storms. So... She's hoping the storm won't turn into a full-blown thing, but to try to settle her nerves, she heads down to the library to get a book. And Anthony was also up late in his study, and he hears the storm hit. He really likes them, so he's kind of enjoying it, but then decides it's time to head to bed. So he walks down the hall and sees the library door slightly open. And though he walks in to see who might be awake and if they need anything, being a good host, but he finds Kate huddled under a table in a full-blown panic, like not even registering who he is and what's happening. He has never seen anyone so terrified in his life. So he crawls under the table and puts an arm around her for comfort and just says soothing things to her and just tries to get her to calm down and to kind of come back to the present. And as she does, she starts to tell him about the fears and how silly it is. And because he wasn't mocking or condescending, he really just, he talked about understanding that there are fears that we don't understand. And they really have a moment of connection. And Kate really starts to see this other side of him, a side of him that is softer. And she notices that he has his own fears that maybe he's not ready to face. She can see that haunted look in his eyes when he talks about knowing that there are fears that we cannot comprehend. So the next day, after that kind of profound evening, they see each other in the garden again. And Kate tells Anthony that she has withdrawn her objection to him marrying her sister. And he is a bit put off by that because obviously he's feeling such a strong pull to her. And this really does change their dynamic. And he doesn't really know what to think about it. But he doesn't have a lot of time to process that. Because as they're sitting there, a bee starts buzzing around Kate. And Anthony has a meltdown. Yes. And the bee ends up stinging Kate. Which for her, she says, ouch, nasty bee. Poor thing. And brushes it away. And Anthony just goes pale and panics and she tells him to stop acting so strangely it's not going to kill me to which he simply replies it might and he in his panic is like trying it it stung her near her collarbone and he's like trying to express the venom and then he's like i can't and so he obviously The next thing that comes to his mind is to try to suck the venom out and so while he's making that attempt who should stumble upon them but her stepmother mary lady bridgerton and unfortunately mrs featherington the biggest gossip in the ton Uh oh so so they're getting married (laughs) they're getting married that's what comes out of that situation and the wedding is taking place in a week's time and over the course of that week they go back to london they're going through the motions She hasn't really seen Anthony a lot, but he does come by, gives her a betrothal ring, and also is very frank with her and tells him he does not want love out of the marriage. And yeah, so he was so worried about getting married to Kate kind of earlier in the book because he thought, 
you know, he, he didn't quite admit it in so many words, but he thought she was maybe someone he could fall in love with. But once this situation happens and they have to get married, he kind of goes, you know what, she's actually going to make a great wife and tries to convince himself of a lot of things that, you know, are very unlikely. So, <laughs> so he does tell her, though, like you said, that this is not going to be a love match, but it is going to be a very good match for both of them. Yes. And Kate's a little put off, but he kisses so very nicely. Yeah. So she doesn't really understand, but she goes with it because, as you said, he he believes it's going to be a very good match. And she has learned to really like Anthony. So the night before the wedding, she gets a talk. Her talk is much better than Daphne's talk. Much better. Her stepmom, Mary, is great. And, you know, as a reader, I don't need an explicit sex talk about the mechanics because that's not what I'm really here for. But Mary does give her a really good talk where she talks about her own personal experience with her first marriage versus her second marriage. And it's really heartfelt. And I I, I thought it was So leaps and bounds and, you know, galaxies away from Violet Bridgerton's attempt. And I think the most, the biggest thing Mary does is she reassures Kate that Anthony's a man that's going to consider her in all things. By the way he treats his family, he's going to really do his best to consider her in all that he does. Yeah, so then we have their wedding night and it's encounter number one. Yes. Um, Yeah, she tries to put off. It doesn't work. But it's okay. She ends up being very happy she decided not to put it off. And they kind of settle into the routine as a married couple. He goes and does lordly things all day, and she makes calls and does this and that. And then at night, they have good times together. They are really enjoying their nights together, and they are separate during the day. But Kate doesn't see anything wrong with it. Anthony's just very busy with all of his things. So one night, Anthony had come home early and they ended up getting it on. I don't know if that counts as encounter number two. It was kind of a weird scene. Like it started but didn't finish. So I don't know if it counts. I honestly don't even remember it. (laughs) There you go. I'm not going to count it then. So they skipped a ball and they ended up just hanging out with each other instead. And all of a sudden, as Kate is sleeping, Anthony is awake and he hears a storm approaching, so he tries to comfort her. But Kate, even in sleep, notices the storm and has a full-blown panic. And when she eventually wakes up, they talk about the panic, and he tells her that she was yelling out for her mother in a very childlike voice during the storm. So he thinks that maybe she should go talk to Mary about it. And she does, and Mary apologizes for not telling her sooner, but it turns out that Kate, there was a storm the night her mother died and it ended up and it kind of knocked a tree through the window right when her mother died and Kate was in the room. So it's been very traumatizing for her. The biggest thing that comes out of it, though, is that Anthony was there for her. And in that moment, she realizes that she loves him because he sits with her and he holds her hand and he's there while she's discovering this and he wants her to he wants to support her in this. And He also realizes that he loves her because she is a strong person and she has faced her demons and she's won and Anthony is jealous because he has not been able to do the same. So now he has a lot of internal conflict because God damn it, he loves his wife. Yeah. And it's like the one thing he was the most afraid of. And so he's got this huge fear looming over him and also this jealousy of her being able to like you said get over her demons and so what does a man in the early 1800s in a romance novel do when they have a lot of internal conflict they go get drunk yep (laughs) so so the next morning they had talked about it at night anthony just left the house he ended up getting drunk kate's like you're gonna be back he's like later and she gets a note from eloise bridgerton in the morning telling her that anthony's at bridgerton house and he looks terrible so kate goes in to try to talk to him and he really doesn't want to talk to her. He's like, I need to figure stuff out. So Kate leaves him to it. She's like, well, fine, but you need to come home because you're definitely not going to figure it out on your own. So he ends up going off to the club where he sees his brothers and they just are like, dude, go home to your wife. You look terrible. And he's like, by golly, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, I think they even tell her like, go tell her you love her or something. And yeah, finally, he's like, 
I should do that. I love yeah. her. And so he goes running off to find Kate. Yes. Kate's not home, though. She's out for a drive with Edwina and her new beau. So Anthony heads to the park. When he arrives at the park, he sees a carriage careening out of control, and he sees that Kate and Edwina are inside the carriage. So he tries to gallop up to help, and then it hits a rock, and he sees it. Basically, he sees a carriage accident happen in which Kate and Edwina uh, are involved. And Anthony could only watch in horror as his wife died before his eyes. But she doesn't actually die, guys. That's just his thoughts on the matter. So Edwina is out of the wreckage and for the most part, okay. Shaken. She's trying to get to Kate. Her bow was thrown farther from the carriage and has a big lump on his head, but seems to be all right. And Kate is stuck inside the carriage. So Anthony is scrambling, trying to get her out. She's not responding. He finally gets his fingers on her neck and finds a pulse. And he's saying things to her like, don't do this to me. Not now. It isn't her time. Do you hear me? It isn't her time. He felt something wet on his cheeks and dimly realized that it was tears. It was supposed to be me, he said, choking on the words. It was always supposed to be me. But then she wakes up and goes, what? What are you saying? (laughs) You know? Yes. And so while they don't talk about that right then, he tells her that he loves her. And he says, if I get you out of this, will you tell me the same? And she nods. (laughs) So he gets her out of the carriage and they realize her leg must be broken. It is. And when she gets out of the carriage and sees her leg, she passes out. Basically, they look at the leg and it is not the normal shape of a leg. So they know it's broken. It's not just like, maybe. Yeah, no, no, no. It's for sure broken. And she passes out. So she gets treated by the surgeon. And when she wakes up, Anthony is there. And they talk about his fears with his dad and how he really didn't want love because he knows, like, he he just has this knowledge that he's going to die young. And while Kate doesn't dismiss his fears, she does tell him it's a little silly, but if we only have this short time together, then we better make the most of it and better live our life to the fullest. Yeah, she basically... She doesn't dismiss his feelings, but she is pretty pointed about the fact that he shouldn't let those things rule the way he lives the years that he has. So that's what she just insists that he get over. She basically says, I don't know if you'll ever be able to get over this until you are 39 years old, until you have lived longer than that. But in the interim, hopefully you can live your life in a really wonderful way. Yes. And some of our last words from Anthony's internal dialogue was, this woman made him a better person. He'd been good and strong and kind before, but with her at his side, he was something more. Very wonderful sentiment. Yes. And then we have our epilogue where Anthony reaches his 39th birthday. Yes, he does. And Even in a further note from Julia Quinn at the end of the book, she makes a statement that she believes that she has some creative license with her character and therefore Anthony doesn't have any allergies and he lives to the ripe old age of 92. So, (laughs) perfect. So we have one final quote from our epilogue that really sums up the end of our Kate and Anthony romance, which is... It means that love isn't about being afraid that it will all be snatched away. Love's about finding the one person who makes your heart complete, who makes you a better person than you ever dreamed you could be. It's about looking in the eyes of your wife and knowing all the way down to your bones that she's simply the best person you've ever known. So beautiful. Yeah. And while we fan ourselves and recover from all of this sweetness... Shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall.
Hello, lovely listeners. So, just a bit of housekeeping here in our parlor. You know, the usual things like planning the week's meals, speaking to the housekeeper about the silver, meeting with the contractor about the new paper for the breakfast room renovation, you know, you know, um, that. And perhaps if you have a book recommendation, you can write to us with that. So if you have an author that's maybe a little bit different than the general stuff that we talk about, or like an inclusive author, we'd love to hear about it because we don't read so many of those books and we know there's a lot of great ones out there. So let us know through our email, romancepod at gmail.com. And if you'd like to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at T as in Tom and as in Nancy Strumpets. We're also on Facebook at Facebook slash T as in Tom and as in Nancy Strumpets. And we're also on YouTube where you can find all our episodes. And if you really want to be in the know, sign up for our email notifications on our website. Our website is romancepod.com. And don't forget Get to please rate, review, and subscribe. We're everywhere, but reviews on Apple Podcasts are the most helpful. And if you're feeling even more charitable, perhaps recommend us to a friend. That would be super if you'd like to do that. Yes, please. So let's discuss this book. Kelsey, what did you what what are your general thoughts? I remembered why I really loved Anthony because in Daphne's book, I was like, God, Anthony's such an ass. And I couldn't get past it because I had such good memories of him and I couldn't remember why if he was such an ass. And then reading this book, you really see the depth of his character. And yes, he's still an ass from time to time. He still has it. He still has a temper. He still doesn't say the right thing. And he's still very like macho man about it sometime. And he's high handed. But he has a good heart. And he truly loves his family. He wants to do the right thing. He's a caring individual. He doesn't scoff at someone who's having, you know, fears in a storm. He's someone that go even if there's animosity, he goes down and tries to help them because that's who he is. So and we get a little bit more about his background to kind of help us understand a little bit more, too. So. I agree. And there's a note actually in the beginning of this book about how Julia Quinn went back to the Duke and I when she was writing this book because the Duke and I was not yet published and she changed the timeline of when their father had died. So when she first wrote the book, The Duke and I, she had it in there that Anthony's father had died two years previously. And to me, that makes Anthony's actions so much more understandable. If his father had died two years previously and he had just become the Viscount, he was still very fresh and raw in his grief for his father's death. And all of a sudden he's head of the family and he wasn't expecting that at all. It just, it makes sense why he was so much of an ass because he would have been struggling with how to be the new head of the family. So to me, all of a sudden, that like clicked in my brain of like this window into Anthony. So if that was the original intent in The Duke and I, I almost would have forgiven Anthony so much more in that book had it been that his father had died two years earlier and he was wrestling with all that. Yes, but I think that having changed it to be 10 years earlier, I think that kind of allows for Anthony to have those deep-seated fears about marriage. Absolutely. So I think that, I think you're right. I think the two years previously would have given more of an understanding of Anthony and the Duke and I. Yep. But it didn't really give him the depth of character in this book. So he needed the 10 years in this book. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why she went back and changed it. And, um, you know, I alluded in another episode that I've lost someone very important to me and I lost my father very suddenly and very unexpectedly, uh, due to complications from a surgery that should not have been life-threatening. And so I obviously identify very strongly with Anthony and this book. Not only do I just identify because I'm also, you know, a member of that club, but his his reaction and his relationship with his father is seriously a mirror to my soul because the way he describes his father being, you know, the most important person in his life and he can never do anything 
like that. That's exactly how I felt losing my dad. And so I completely understand how his struggles were and how he worked through life to try to always be as good as his dad and try to just, and just at the same time, knowing he would never be as good of a a person as his father was. And, you know, I'm not a character in a book. And so I've had my own developments and, and I certainly don't think that I'll never do as great of things as my father did rationally, but irrationally, I think I will never do as great things as my father could have done. So I totally get it. I get it so much. And I mean, I've read this book a couple of times. I remembered the dead dad stuff and I was expecting it. And yet I, when I read the prologue, I cried at the end. It is. Oh, it's so heart wrenching. And it's beautifully done. It really is. But she did such a great job with Simon's prologue too. Yeah. So there's a quote actually from Grey's Anatomy. And I just want to share it because I think Every time that I talk about dead dads, I think of this quote because I think it so perfectly encompasses the feeling of losing your father. And so there are two characters speaking to each other. And Christina says, there's a club, the dead dad's club, and you can't be in it until you're in it. You can try to understand. You can try to sympathize. But until you feel that loss, my dad died when I was nine, George. I'm really sorry you had to join the club. And George says, I... I don't know how to exist in a world where my dad doesn't. And Christina says, yeah, that never really changes. And I just feel like sharing that because I think it sums up kind of everything about that. Not to insert levity into the serious situation, because that's not what I'm about. (laughs) But let's just God bless Shonda Rhimes, who's putting the Bridgerton series together. Yes, I just saying <laughs> I very much hope that she gives as much, you know, as much love to this as she is she gave to Grey's Anatomy and many of her other shows. So, on that note, I have a sad note about the Bridgertons, which we've sort of mentioned before, which is that the rumor is that Kate and Anthony are not together in the series on Netflix. And reading this book, I had such a hard time because the character who Anthony is rumored to be with uh, is Sophia Rosso, not Sophia, sorry, uh, somebody Rosso. It's uh, anyhow, she's an opera singer. And it's it's, the soprano. It's the soprano that we mentioned before. And so as I was reading that, I was like really upset because I was like, no, like this is, and if she gets stung by a bee and the whole same thing happens and then they have a marriage of convenience, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for me. I'm trying to like prepare myself for it. And the reason that I feel like this rumor is very likely is because the whole cast has been announced and no one named Kate Sheffield has been cast. So I just hope that, they have a, a little bit of a different love story and don't have Anthony and Kate's love story. I, I hope so, too. I hope it's more just like a side thing where, like, it's just proving that Anthony is a rake because she's his mistress. Yeah, I don't know. the And because we do know that Anthony, they do mention that Anthony and the Soprano did have a thing back in, like, a while mm-hmm. ago. And Anthony, like, the whole idea of them making eyes at each other was to try to renew that. So I'm hoping it's not really, like, a thing thing. And he's not. But then again, how... Maybe there are, I don't know, because I also know that Benedict's love interest has not been cast either. Her name- this is why my idea of the season being like one book for each season, which is why they haven't cast Kate Sheffield, because Kate Sheffield has nothing to do in Daphne's first book. I know, fingers crossed. I'm so, I'm so hoping that that's it, or maybe there's some of the love. Anyhow, okay, let's move back to the book. Besides the point, (laughs) let's go back to this book. I, my other thoughts on the book were I really liked Kate- Mm -hmm. as a character and I remember very strongly liking Kate as a character simply because I think she's just a very good counterpart for Anthony she does have her internal struggles you know where she's like I'm not as beautiful as my sister I'm a little bit more plain I'm a little clumsy but she doesn't let them really affect her and like yes she needs a little convincing from Anthony but not a ton yeah she has her insecurities but she doesn't let that rule her and I think Julia Quinn did a great job with a you know quote unpretty heroine because Basically, at at a couple different quotes, Julia Quinn says something about, like, 
you know, she knew that she wasn't the antidote to Edwina's beauty, but compared to her, it just wasn't the same. You know, her face yeah. and her form are pleasing enough. But when compared, it's just not the same. And I get that because, you know, I think of myself, you know, uh, sometimes I'm hard on myself, but, you know, I am a I am a 30 something year old woman now. And <laughs> I I do think I'm pretty. I clean up OK, you know, but then sometimes I watch stupid television shows or good television shows and you just see these absolutely stunningly gorgeous women and you realize like that's just a it's just a little bit of a different category right and I don't compare myself to them but it's just different no I just have to remind myself that they have a team making them look that way Mm -hmm. and I don't have a team making me look that way because when I have someone help me with my shit Oh, yeah. I look very nice. (laughs) I mean, I felt like I looked pretty good on my wedding and then I had to, you know. You looked beautiful on your wedding. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. It was very fun. It was a great day. We'll talk more about our weddings after you have one. Yes. Um, Not really speaking of weddings, but the idea of a wedding creating a family. I loved that Kate's family was one of support. And it wasn't one of internal tension. It was a completely one of love and support. And I felt like Anthony's spouse needed that because that's what's mm-hmm. so important to being the head of the Bridgerton family yeah. is that level of love and support for the family and being the head of the family. And this family is so close that I don't think he could have married someone who didn't have that in their life. Absolutely. And I just think, I mean, I think Kate is fun and good too. I liked her. I liked her wit. I liked her strength with her family. And in general, the dynamic of her family with a half sister and a stepmother, and, you know, she's lost her real mother and her father, but they have this just absolutely wonderful bond. And her, you know, we don't have the evil stepmother trope. And I think that's really fun because, I mean, evil stepmother trope can be fun too. But it's nice to see something different. In fact, Mary talks about visiting her mother's grave with Kate, and they would always take her there and talk to her and tell her how Kate was doing. And it's just, it's so sweet and so wonderful. It really is. Because that's like, it's, it's just so nice to think about love in all of its forms. Exactly. And I like that, you know, she's referred to as Mary, even by Kate. And she's like, I've just always called her Mary. And I think it's just because Mary was like, I'm not here to replace your mother. I'm not trying to be your mom. I'm just I'm I'm your Mary. Yeah. You know, and that's just how that is. On another side note, too, uh, Kate's reaction to her broken leg was so great because I also (laughs) have broken a limb where to the point where it looked like a Tetris block. And I I, again, could totally relate because, you know, she gets pulled out of the rubble and she's like, oh, wait a minute, where's Edwina? Is she okay? Is she this? And then she's like, yeah, my leg hurts, whatever. And then she looks down and goes, oh, like, and (laughs) faints. And now I didn't faint, but I did. I fell off my bike and then I started screaming for help. And then I looked over at my arm. It's like, I just instinctively knew I could not move. And then I looked over at my arm and there was a little Tetris block and I was like, whoa. And then it like hurt differently too. Yeah. See, I, I've i also, not badly that I did like break my foot and I was like in the middle of doing something and I was by myself. So like very calm and collected, you know, I walked. I like got the I was walking three dogs and I broke my foot. So I like hobble over to my car, get the dogs in the car, call John. And then I was like, you what are you doing? You need to meet me right now. (laughs) I hurt myself. And it's not a good hurt. Like this is definitely like a bad hurt. I need to go to the doctor. Yikes. (laughs) Because I was like, it's starting to swell. But it was like the second I got off the phone, all of a sudden the tears that I hadn't shed at all, like just came streaming down. And then I was like, you have to get yourself to the location. You need to drive your car now. (laughs) Yes. So before we move on, one other note about the book that I think is interesting, because a lot of the time in these series, we have crazy ways that parents died. And this book is no different in a way. The way that Kate's mother died was very dramatic and traumatic. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really interesting that Viscount Bridgerton died of a bee sting. It's the most original death that we have. It's not just a a carriage accident, although we do have a carriage accident in this book. But I, I just think it adds such a unique dimension to the story. 
you know? I agree. And I, I will say, I don't think I've ever had a parent. I've never read a book with a parent death that was so on par with this one. Yeah. And not that we want parents to die, but it definitely makes for a lot more dimension and and interest for the way that characters respond to something like that. Absolutely. And I think my last comment on the book, you know, talking about Kate is we have seen Anthony's temper. We know he has a temper. We know he can turn into an ass at the drop of a hat. And I think that Kate does such a wonderful job of not backing down to it and facing it head on, not to goad him into... She doesn't goad him. She yeah. approaches him with rationality and just points out where his, like, the flaws in his argument and just kind of stops him in his tracks. Yes, I agree. Uh, he could not have a simpering miss to his temper to make him grow and learn how to to tamper that temper. So I completely agree. Yes, So speaking of our heroine, what would you rate Kate? I really want to rate Kate like a nine. Whoa. I really like Kate. I just, there's just something about her. She's just very, she's like, she's just rational. And I feel like she has a bit of the badassery that I want from my like top tier heroines. I, I don't disagree, except I don't agree completely. I like Kate. I think Kate had a lot of potential. I wish there'd just been like a little bit more, a little more dialogue between them. We got a lot of kind of exposition and thinking for the characters and we didn't Mm -hmm. get quite as much of the witty banter that we got in Simon and Daphne's book that I thought. But I think Kate's a great heroine. Don't get me wrong. I just didn't I didn't connect with her, with her that much, this this read. And so I would rate her a seven. I think she's solid. Yeah. I think she's good. I, I don't have any complaints about her at all, but I just wasn't – I didn't get that passion that I got from some other books we've read. I think that for me, that's what puts her at like a nine instead of a, a ten for me gotcha. is like – because like I said, I really like her. I like that she is fiery. I like that she's not afraid to speak. And the wit that we did get was great. Yeah. And I think that, you know, had we gotten more of it, she probably would have been up in the 10 region for me. But we're sticking at nine. Gotcha. And Anthony, where does he stand for you? Anthony stands at, hmm, I'm going to say like 7.58. Fair. And why? Like, I think all his redeeming qual. I think he's low just because he is like he can be such an ass and has a temper, you know, but people are human, which is why he ends up in the like, you know, around the eight ish category and because it's mainly because of all his redeeming qualities and the fact that he was very even honest in his internal dialogue about his feelings for Kate, like he was pushing them aside, but didn't. But then when they kept persisting, you know, was very acknowledging of it. And then when forced to marry her, he didn't like he accepted it faster than she did. Yes. And he was happy about it. He was. He would never have chosen her himself because of his internal conflicts. But when he was forced to marry her, he was like, yes, because this is actually what I wanted to do. But my brain was telling me not to. (laughs) So for me, Anthony is also a seven. (laughs) I, again, think he's great. I so identify with all of the dad stuff. It is like Julia Quinn looked into my soul and wrote it on the page. At one point in the end, she writes, since my readers are almost exclusively women and Anthony's issue is such a, quote, guy thing, I worried that you might not be able to relate to his problem. And she's kind of referring to the reaction he had of, like, thinking that he wouldn't outlive his father, but also other parts of just his reaction and the way he thought about his dad. And I just want to say, have no fear, Julia. It was honestly like you were writing my life on the page. It is such a clear like window into my soul and who I was all those years ago. And it's just, and, and, and to a degree who I am today, but I still, even though I identified with that and I like that Anthony's got his ups and his downs, I just, I didn't love, love, love him. I didn't have that same reaction that I did when, to Miles, for example, Redmond, you know, mm. when I, I think I gave Miles Redmond an eight and I just yeah. was gushing over him. And I think Anthony's great. 
So to me, he's a seven. All right. Excellent. And do you have a funny or best or favorite quote to share? Uh, my quotes are a bit more serious. But As is mine. <laughs> yeah, but I think that they're very wonderful. So the first one was from the prologue. So this is where Anthony sees Daphne and finds out his father has died. But before he could finish his question, Daphne lifted her head and the shattering heartbreak in her large brown eyes cut through him like a knife. Oof. Yeah. And that just, ugh, ugh. And then this one is at the end of the book when he's talking with Kate about his fears and his concerns and his demons. His voice caught. The choking sound seemed unmanly. It made him vulnerable. But he didn't care because this was Kate. And it didn't matter if she saw his deepest fears because he knew she'd love him no matter what. It was a sublimely freeing feeling. Very beautiful. Yeah. So my, I had two quotes, one of which we actually already shared before. So I'm going to just do the one that I have here. And mine is also a bit of a solemn one. And mm -hmm. honestly, you could replace the word Anthony with the word Zoe and it would, <laughs> it would absolutely be true. So this is also from the prologue. And it reads, Anthony's father was, quite simply, the greatest man he'd ever known, possibly the greatest man who'd ever lived. To think that he might be more than that seemed conceited in the extreme. So, on that solemn note, let's move to something a little bit lighter, shall we? We shall. <laughs> so, we've got our encounter counter now. And I, after reading it, wrote down two. Two solid encounters. Okay. Makes sense. I think that's where I'm at, too. <laughs> and our so for our steaminess rating, the way that I see this is, like, I didn't think it was the steamiest thing I've ever read. In fact, like, I kind of thought it was, like, a nice cup of your go-to tea. It's, like, ready to drink right now. You better drink it fast before it gets cold. I would agree with that, actually. On a steaminess rating. I think on a – I love it on a character development level. Mm -hmm. I love it on a – characters just themselves level i love it in the plot level but when it comes to like the actual steaminess of the two characters like it's a cup of tea it's it's beautiful and nice but the steaminess comes from the fact that you know they're to be they're meant to be together not because there's some hard wrought sexual tension <laughs> agreed and for our feminist recap i rated this as a supporter do you agree i would agree with that yes because, and the way, the reason that I find it to be a supporter is not that, like, the woman is knocking, you know, doing crazy things for society, but it is promoting good relationships between women. You see a lot of interaction between Kate and Mary and Edwina. You also see good interactions with Lady Bridgerton and Kate. You and see, Penelope. And Penelope and Daphne. And so there's a lot of these, like, supportive female relationships and 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 so i just think that that's a really beautiful thing to showcase and is is a beautiful thing to showcase and also her stepmother does want to equip her daughter with the knowledge about sex before carting her off to the marriage bed so i appreciated that <laughs> and the scene where she, where kate finds out about her mother's death she comes to mary and you know we in our recap we kind of breezed over it a little bit but mary hadn't withheld this information from Kate because she thought it that Kate shouldn't know it. She thought that Kate didn't remember. She didn't think that Kate had any trauma because of it. And that's why she, she hadn't told her. And when Kate admits that she's been hiding this pain and this trauma her whole life from Mary, Mary is devastated about it. She feels like she fails as a mother. And so they have a really honest conversation. Again, good pictures of women having honest conversations together and supporting each other and growing from it. So absolutely, I call it a supporter. I would also agree with that. And I also just think that each of the women in the book are all strong women in their own regard. You know, Mary yeah. is a strong mother figure. Edwina, even though she's pretty, she's not vapid or vain. She wants Kate to be just as happy as she wants herself to be happy. There's no competition between them you know Daphne meets Kate and is instantly I like her 
And same thing when Kate meets Daphne, they have an instant connection as friends. And then when she sees Penelope, instead of pitying Penelope, you know, they make friends about it. They make jokes about what Whistledown has said. All the interactions that you see with the women are all positive. And yes, we have the one nasty debutante, but she's more there to show case Anthony's caring. And that's the only negative female interaction you have through the whole thing. Absolutely. And she gets shot down for being a bad person. So exactly. I like that. So finally, what would you rate this book? I would rate this book an eight. Solid. Any yes. any comment? No, I think I've made all my comments. I really <laughs> liked Kate. I really liked Anthony. I will say I think I liked it better than the Duke and I. I I agree, I think. This book to me is a seven. Again, I liked it and it is a good book. When I was reading it, I wasn't having that much fun. And I was just Mm. like, why is that? And it's not, this isn't like, oh, I'm sad reading about dead dad stuff or any of that. Like, I didn't have any of those feelings about it at all. Because generally speaking, if a character has a big arc from that, like, that's really rewarding, which he does. But I just was kind of like, it was missing a little something for me. And I don't know what it was. I think that there are just better books out there. I think if I had really felt vindictive today, I would have said it was like a six or a 6.5. But then I started thinking about it and I was like, that's just not true for this book. This book (laughs) is a good book. It is well written. It's got interesting characters. It's got interesting dynamics. It is feminist supporter. I just wasn't madly in love with it, but I would highly recommend it. So, So a seven. I think this is a good book. There you go. Okay, what are we reading next time? So next time, we're going to be taking on a novella. Yay! Because I don't have that much free time anymore. I know, you're preparing to go away for your wedding for a little bit of time, so we thought, let's squeeze in one more recording, but make it a little bit quicker. So we're going to see what that's like, because novellas are are just a whole different ballgame, so that'll be fun to explore. It will be fun. And I honestly haven't read many novellas. I've only really read novellas either in a series that I absolutely loved and then I found out a character I liked only had a novella, so then I read it. Cool. Or I just picked it out and didn't realize it was a novella because sometimes I read the description and think, it's great. And then I'm going along, I'm like, why is this show short? Why am I already halfway through it? I feel like I just got started. (laughs) But so yeah, I don't read them very often. So we have chosen... The novella from Zoe's favorite series, which is the Brother Sinister series. We're going to be reading book 0.5, which is The Governess Affair by Courtney Milan. And Kelsey has not read this before. I have not read this before. I have read Courtney Milan, so I know the author, but I have not read this one because, as I said, I rarely read novellas. So it's going to be fun and exciting. I know what's to come. Kelsey doesn't. And that's going to be a lot of fun. So join us next week as we read The Governess Affair. Thanks for listening. Yes, so today we are talking about the Vicant. I I said Vicant. I don't know where that came from. (laughs) Today we're talking about Bridgerton's book two, which is the Viscount who loved me. I wrote it wrong on the thing. Let me take that again. Um, (laughs) The Viscount who loved me by Julia Quinn. We shall. um, We're going to, in this book, we have a couple of uh, running tropes as you were as uh, the I don't know what I'm saying <laughs> we've, yes we've got Sorry. we've got our our main character blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> I just oh my god okay and they're great if I could include them all in here and have this be a coherent podcast I will I definitely thought about, like, could we do, like, a silly little skit with, like, reading Lady Whistledown? But then I was like, oh, there's just so much to include. Maybe not this time. Maybe a couple nope. books from now. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> um, because she's the same way. That's a note. 
I don't know why that got in a quote section. That's why I was, <laughs> I'm confused. Those are my words. That's not a book word. That's my I know. words. I was like, why are you stumbling so much? But it was just because you were like, wait, what, huh? Is this a quote? Uh, no, it, this is me. Excellent. Yes. Sorry. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> we shall see you next time. Not actually because you're not visible to us. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. All right, and pause.